Tom, that was a terrific reminder that there will be adult beverages after our final presenter and Jim Butts, who is going to talk to us about factors affecting selection of Matt's mercury control technologies is from Novinda Corporation. And he has the very enviable position of being the last speaker between you and the bar. So I know you will give him your full attention and he will do his level best to keep us here till about 6.30. So Jim, <laughs> it's all yours. Thank you, Todd. I would maybe argue it's unenviable, <laughs> but uh, in the interest of uh, getting you all off to happy hour, I promise to be relevant and useful and perhaps even brief. So let's get on with it. I'm going to spend a few minutes today talking about factors that affect the selection of a MATS control technology. Uh, and we will perhaps, there we go, be covering the following topics. Um, we'll start by uh, discussing some of the issues that need to be considered when you're talking about uh, MATS control technology evaluation. Get into test planning, uh, talk a little bit about trial equipment. Uh, mercury measurements. I know this morning uh, Bruce Kaiser mentioned what a critical issue that is, and I certainly concur with that. We'll talk about that a little more. Uh, balance of plant impact, which I think is always important to consider when you're talking about uh, a new system to add to your plant. I will then uh, give you an example using one of the uh, performance trials that we ran with amended silicates uh, in the last year uh, and give you a little bit of uh, insight as to how we set that up, how we planned it, the kind of data we collected and how we analyzed it, and then we'll finish with some analysis and some recommendations. So there we go. So when you're talking about a MATS compliance strategy, I think the first thing that you have to recognize is that uh, coal-fired units pretty much are like snowflakes. Each one is somewhat individual. You're never going to see two that are exactly alike. So what you're most likely going to need to do is some full-scale testing to determine whether your specific options are, uh, which one is going to give you uh, the best result. And even in, uh, you need to consider the plant configuration in determining which options are worth testing. The next thing that's important is you need to find out what you already know. Do you have some mercury data for your plant? Do you know what the coal is, uh, mercury content of the coal is? Do you have measurements that were made at an earlier date? Um, as Bruce mentioned this morning, if that, if that information is somewhat aged, you may want to uh, consider the quality of it because we've come a long way in terms of making quality mercury measurements in the last uh, five years or so. So if, you're, if your information is, say, prior to 2009 or so, I would at least confirm that it came from a quality source and that you uh, uh, can uh, rely upon the information. You'll want to look at the technology options that are out there. There are many. There are sorbents, there are oxidation systems, there are uh, uh, approaches that rely upon the ability of a wet scrubber to capture oxidized mercury because it's soluble. So what you want to look at is the coal that your plant is firing, you want to look at the age of the unit, you want to look at what technologies you've got deployed in your system for uh, treatment of the flue gas, environmental controls, because all those will influence the options which may or may not be relevant and important to your particular configuration. If you've got uh, a newer plant, for example, it may be worth going with a higher cost capital approach that has lower operating costs. If it's a plant that's older, that may not be the case. You may want to look at combinations of technologies, and we've heard about that earlier today from uh, the folks from Owensboro. In fact, they were using three different technologies to get the mercury control that they needed. So that's certainly something that should be considered and evaluated in your planning. And finally, you can't test everything. So you've got to figure out what are your best options and then determine what's the available budget so you can use that in the planning of your trial. So when you approach a full scale trial of mercury control technologies, I think it's important to start with the end in mind. What you want to do is uh, get together with your team, prepare a list of objectives. 
Um, are you simply going to compare vendors, or do you want to actually make optimization of a process part of your uh, field trial? Do you want to look at such elements as the location of the injection lances uh, or lance design uh, on mercury capture? Do you want to include balance of plan impacts and, and at least gather sufficient data that you can put some uh, bounds on what that might be? You want to then take those objectives and use those to help you define both the tasks that you want to include in your, in your trial and to define the test matrix. And then you want to look at the measurement requirements and as Bruce mentioned and others have mentioned, the quality of your mercury data is absolutely paramount in your test. So don't skimp on that. Don't compromise. Do whatever you need to do to get quality mercury data. I love this quote from General Eisenhower. He said, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. And I think his point was the activity around planning is absolutely critical, but you have to stay flexible. I probably participated in 40 or 50 different field trials. I don't know of one that ever went exactly the way we planned it out in advance. You always find something unexpected, something interesting that you decide to include in your test matrix, for example. So the activities surrounding a field project, uh, let's, let's talk through those a little bit. First is that you need to prepare and agree upon the test plan, and as we've mentioned, that is going to uh, revolve around having a comprehensive set of objectives and then using those objectives to plan the details of what you want to do. You want to make sure that the vendors that you think you're going to use are available and that they can provide the surfaces, uh, services that you need and uh, anticipate. I know especially this summer there's a lot of testing activity going on availability is going to be a real challenge. So think about that. Once you have your trial objectives, I think you want to make certain you include in those quantitative targets so that your test team knows what they're aiming to get. For example, MATS is 1.3 pounds per trillion BTUs. A lot of plants are saying we want to be at one pound per trillion BTU or less. I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> um, to, um, to make certain that we are below the limit. So if you've got a margin of safety you want built into your, uh, your test plan, make certain that that is, is explicitly uh, noted in the documents so that everybody knows the targets they're shooting for. Um, you're going to have to set up the temporary equipment for the trial, and as I mentioned, scheduling can be an issue in that case. You have to install and operate your mercury measurement equipment. Baseline information is always very valuable. You want to make certain that you at least uh, dedicate a few days to get some baseline so you know not only what your incoming vapor phase mercury numbers look like, but you also know what your uncontrolled stack numbers look like. It may be that your actual mercury incremental capture is very small. If you're down at two or three pounds per trillion and you need to get to 1.2, it's not, you, you only need mercury capture on the order of uh, 50 or 60 percent. If you're up at 10 and you got to get to 1.2, now you're looking at 90 percent capture. It's a big difference. Um, you want to uh, make certain that you understand all the, uh, the additional data, the incidental data from the operational data from the plant that you're going to collect during the testing because that's important and you'll want that later as you uh, sit down and correlate your results with the plant operating conditions at the time. And finally, you'll want to uh, plan for uh, sampling and analysis so that you know uh, what the what the conditions are in the coal, what's in the fly ash, and other streams. For example, if you're running a wet FGD, you'll want to look at your scrubber liquor and actually look at mercury content, not only of the, of the filtrate on there, but also in the, in the solids.
Um, in addition, you'll want to make certain you analyze your full data set because you really will want to look at the big picture. Uh, plant operation has changed a lot in the last few years. Uh, once upon a time, if you knew what the full load conditions were and what the full load mercury capture was, that's all you cared about. Very few plants are base loaded anymore. A lot of plants have gone to modes where they're cycling to follow uh, demand. For that situation, you'll want to make sure that your test plan includes substantial operation at low load conditions so you understand how that affects the ability of your system to meet the mats and the uh, e economics because that may turn out to be a substantial portion of your operating time at uh, a particular unit. Make certain you look at trends in the data because that can be very revealing. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, at Novinda we are uh, very insistent that we have uh, SEMS in the measurement uh, suite. SEMS are something that will give you that ability to look at trends. You can't see that when you're running a one or a two or a four hour um, method 30B trap, important. Look at the other ancillary studies that may be required, uh, TCLPs. Is there some sort of analysis of fly ash samples or scrubber samples that you'll need to do? Incorporate a full economic analysis, and that means not only capital costs and operating costs, but balance of plan impact and even, in some cases, disposal costs. Um, and then finish it up. Put a bow around it. Do, do the analysis, prepare a recommendation for MATS compliance so that your management can have a nicely uh, technically valid and substantiated uh, decision to make. Let's talk about a couple of the key elements. Portable injection systems are one. If you're looking at options that are using uh, powdered sorbents, such as uh, activated carbon or amended silicates. There are two types of uh, injection systems, portable injection systems that are uh, commonly used. Bulk bag unloaders is the first. The second is portable silo systems. Typically, the biggest uh, parameter that impacts this is the size of a unit. If you've got a large unit, seven, 800 megawatts, where your injection rates are probably 500 to maybe 1,000 pounds an hour or greater, you're pretty well going to be using a uh, portable silo system. Smaller units, bulk bag unloaders will work. Typical, reasonable uh, maximum capacity for a, a bulk bag unloader is probably 500 to 700 pounds an hour, not only from a capacity standpoint, but also from a logistics standpoint. If you're at the point where you're changing bags hourly or on a at less than two hour interval, that's a lot of work and you, you'll have to have a lot of crew on site just to make certain that those bag changes can get done. A uh, couple of different schemes in terms of controls. The, the portable silo systems generally are nicely automated. Bulk bag and loaders kind of run the gamut. You may find some that are very simple, pretty much manually controlled, uh, and you'll, some of those are actually equipped with some fairly sophisticated uh, automatic control systems. And finally, the method by which the powder is introduced into the transport air is important. You've got a choice between adductors and rotary valves. And again, part, uh, in part, the plant configuration may be a factor there. If you've got, for example, a positive pressure at your injection location, most likely an adductor isn't going to work. Inductor relies on having negative pressure at the adductor and then you have to transport from there to the, to the uh, injection location on the ductwork. Um, in dealing with particle injection systems, powder injection systems, key to success in capturing mercury is making certain that the particles can interact with the mercury. So that means you have to have uh, an injection array that does a good job of dispersing the powder in your flue gas duct. You'll want to make certain you have sufficient number of ports and that uh, most likely your lances will have multiple injection locations on the lance so that you can fairly uniformly cover that duct cross-section with material because if the powder doesn't contact the gas, 
I can guarantee you I don't care how efficient the powder is, it's not going to capture mercury that it doesn't see. Uh, the other element that comes into play there is uh, transport air. So you want to make certain that you've got sufficient air to move the powder from your temporary injection skid to the ductwork and get it well dispersed uh, as much as possible. Mercury measurements. Uh, as I have previously mentioned, real-time SEMs, I'm a real believer in these. There are a number of vendors that do a great job. Uh, they'll bring the system in, they make sure it's calibrated, they make sure it's um, well-maintained during a trial, and you're going to get quality data. The trend data is important and very useful. We really like the fact that a SEMS gives us immediate feedback. It's real-time data. You can sit there and you can see if a condition is going to meet mats or not. If it's not, you may do some tweaking to your test matrix in real time. You may find that two pounds per million ACF is not sufficient. Four pounds per million ACF gets you down to a half a pound per trillion BTU. Well, you want to be higher than a half. You don't want to be that low. That's costing you money to inject extra material. So you can go back and you can run a case at two and a half pounds per million ACF or maybe three pounds per million ACF and kind of see where that curve fits uh, on an interpolation basis. Uh, important stuff. Um, and again, as we mentioned, um, I like to see a few 30B traps run during a trial so that you can indeed uh, confirm the quality of your SIMS measurements. I like to see some baseline numbers. Uh, we prefer, if at all possible, to be making real-time upstream measurements so we know what the vapor phase mercury content is on the gas stream before it encounters the mercury control uh, technology. And uh, again, baseline is always important. I talked about that a little earlier. So the field test matrix uh, needs to address all of the objectives in the trial. Um, typically, we will have two components to that. We'll do some parametric testing where we vary one or more parameters. And then once we find the conditions that look to be uh, uh, able to meet the, the uh, objective in terms of, of uh, mercury emissions at the stack, then we'll want to run an extended 12, 24, 48, uh, we'd love to run it for a week or two. Typically, that's not possible given, given uh, budget limitations. But you want to run a, a certain amount of time at a fixed condition to make certain that you, you're, you don't see any hiccups in, um, in the uh, mercury emissions, that you get a nice steady state situation and that, and that you're able to uh, document uh, compliance with the, with the MATS rule. You'll want to uh, make certain that your test durations are sufficient that you actually get to steady state conditions. This can be interesting for different materials. Um, we've seen uh, at smaller plants, typically three to six hours, we can get pretty much to a steady state condition. Larger plants can take longer than that. It can take longer if you've got a bag house as opposed to an ESP. Uh, it depends on the cleaning cycles and the type of the bag house, but it can take uh, 6, 12 hours or more to build up a steady state concentration of that mercury capture agent in the dust cake on the bags. So don't, don't sell your performance short by looking at a two-hour test window and say, okay, we're going to change injection rate after two hours. Probably not. You'll, you'll want to make certain, and again, uh, another... Uh, another reason to look at that real-time mercury measurement with the SEMS, you want to make certain you reach some sort of a reasonable steady state condition uh, for each test case that you're running. Um, you want to make certain that your schedule has built into it some contingency days and some to be determined test conditions. We inevitably find that there's something that happens that we did not expect or anticipate and we want to go back and take another look at a test condition. We want to do some intermediate test condition between two of the tests we've run or whatever. Um, or something fails. We've had parts fail on, on injection skids. We've had uh, belts break. We've had shafts uh, fracture. Inevitably, something's going to happen. You're not going to be able to run every test on every day as it's laid out. 
and you want to make certain that those changes to the test matrix uh, include everyone in the program and that everybody understands what you're doing and, and how you're going to make changes. Balance of plant. A uh, couple interesting things here. I think you'll want to make certain that you identify topics of interest. So location and design of the injection system, we've talked about that. Uh, mercury capture on the flue gas environmental control components. If you've got, for example, um, SOX or NOx or particulates especially, and you're, and you're looking at a technology that's, that's uh, a powder, that may well affect the performance of your particulate control equipment. A good example, if you've got an ESP and you've got a fairly high SO3 content in your gas stream, what you may see is that SO3 impacts the performance of activated carbon. Uh, it's, it's been documented. The industry is working on SO3 resistant carbons. There's progress, but it's, there's going to be an effect. So what plants will do is they will inject hydrated lime to reduce the SO3, improve the performance of their activated carbon. What that means now is that you have a, a higher dust load to the ESP and it's a high resistivity dust. So you have to make certain you understand that there's some interactivity among the various components in the system. Um, you want to make certain you pull the samples, and we've talked about this. You want to look at fly ash, you want to look at scrubber liquids. We will always measure mercury to make certain we can uh, have at least a reasonable mercury balance. If it's coming out of the gas stream, it's got to go somewhere. It's going to be in your fly ash, it's going to be in your scrubber liquor. So let's just double check and make sure that's the case. Um, and then you may want to look at other, uh, other factors, and I'll talk about one. Uh, when I give you the uh, plant example. And um, let's see, we've talked about ESP performance. So one of the things you may want to do is uh, some resistivity measurements before and after uh, uh, on your fly ash samples before and after uh, use of the, uh, the powdered agent, whatever it may be, if it's carbon or if it's cemented silicates. Um, okay. Talk a little bit about amended silicates, and, uh, and then I'll get into the details of, uh, of the sample trial that, that uh, we'll discuss. It's a, a non-carbon, it's a mineral-based reagent. We use bentonite clay as our base. On that, we put a metal sulfide, and the metal sulfide actually chemically reacts with the mercury in the gas stream to form mercuric sulfide. So it's a chemical reaction mechanism as opposed to an adsorption mechanism. The material is non-flammable. It has a broad operating temperature. We have demonstrated at numerous sites very high mercury captures, uh, greater than 90%, and pricing is, uh, is similar to uh, brominated pack. So our sample host unit was a 730 megawatt unit. It was burning PRB coal. It was equipped with a spray dryer absorber and a pulse jet bag house. The plant uh, was operated uh, according to uh, from dispatch according to uh, the load profile that the utility faced. So uh, typically at night, uh, load would drop down in this particular host unit. All that entered into the planning that we did for the trial. Okay, this particular unit had a, a, a SEMS that was permanently installed in the stack. We installed an additional SEMS upstream, so we knew what that upstream uh, uh, mercury number looked like. And we also ran a couple of method 30B traps during our trial to confirm that the uh, stack sims was giving us accurate data. So the, the test itself was a four-day test. Uh, we went to 24-hour operations simply because of the fact that we knew they were running under different load conditions. We wanted to make certain we could document compliance with the regulations under different load conditions. We had a manually controlled skid, and because of the load and because of uh, kind of the crude controls that were on this particular skid, our injection rates uh, varied somewhat. But you'll see what that range looked like when I show you the data. Uh, the data is compiled as hourly averages of stack mercury from the plant stack SEMS, and, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so. 
Here is our full trial data set. So what I'm going to show you is time on the horizontal axis. We've got mercury concentration, and in this case, um, their measurements were all in pounds per gigawatt hour. And then on the right side, it's, it's the feed rate in terms of uh, uh, pounds per million ACF. This is the mercury data. So this particular plant has an existing uh, control requirement. So you can see over here, we had, uh, they, were, they were well below the standard, which is the 0.013 pounds per, per gigawatt hour represented by the solid line. They turned off the carbon, and you can see over the next uh, 10 uh, to 12 hours, they, the mercury rose nicely back up uh, to about a 0.033 or so uh, pounds per gigawatt hour uncontrolled condition. We turned on the amended silicates. We immediately drove the mercury down well below the mats. And we uh, played here somewhat with the, uh, with the injection rate. The plant had, had asked us to try and maintain about a 0.01 pounds per gigawatt hour uh, target for the injection. These green circles are daily averages. So we take 24 of those hourly averages and put them together. We, the first day we started injecting about 10 in the morning, so obviously half the day was uncontrolled. We ended up with about a 0.02 um, number. The second day and the third day and the fourth day, we were all below the, the mats requirement. What happened was we were manning the injection skid uh, 16 hours a day, and the plant agreed to cover overnight uh, operation of the skid. So this is the, uh, the amended silicates injection rates. And you see what happened is about 2 in the morning uh, on each day, day 1, day 2, and day 3, uh, injection stopped. They, they did not do a, a terribly uh, rigorous job of making certain that everything was, was operating. So, and it was a couple hours on days one and three, and, and uh, even worse, uh, was more like four hours uh, in the middle of the night on this day. And you can see the response. We, we see the halt of injection. We see a couple of data points where the mercury is above the mats level. Same thing, uh, here's the four data points that correspond exactly to these four uh, uh, data points where we were injecting no material. As soon as we start injection, we drive it very quickly and very effectively back down below mats. Here's that same set of data with a, a superimposed uh, two method 30B traps. So again, Here's the SEMS data. Here's our method 30B traps, trap one and trap two. And you can see they match up quite well with the SEMS data. We were very pleased uh, with the quality of the, of the uh, correlation here. Balance of plant studies. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, this plant had had some issues with material handling with carbon, so they were interested in the explosibility, flammability of the amended silicates. We ran some tests to document that. Uh, we also uh, were able to take some of our samples from the uh, baghouse hoppers and run those through um, EPA method 1311 TCLP testing for mercury. Um, they were interested in the impact, if any, of our material on the operation of their bag house. So we did some testing, and I'll talk about the details of that. And uh, we will often run concrete compatibility tests. Now, this was an SDA. They do not sell their fly ash, so it was not done at this plant. We have done it at other plants. And if you're interested in that, uh, stop by the tabletop, and we can talk about some of the detail. Flammability. Uh, we submitted a sample of the amended silicates material in, to an independent lab, and they ran the standard ASTM 1226 test. Um, activated carbon subjected to the same test is, has been, uh, in published reports, has been assigned a KST of 42. Uh, the amended silicates was uh, non-explosive. There were, the entire test uh, did not, they did not see any explosion events. So. It's a KST of zero. So that was uh, an exciting difference, uh, at least for, for this particular plant. 
Uh, leachability, we've run numerous uh, EPA method uh, 1311 TCLPs and we've actually run some additional method 1313 which is the fairly recent EPA method that looks at the effect of pH on leachability. What we've seen is that uh, mercury when we, for the, in about two thirds of the samples will come back as non-detect, uh, the other third it comes back as single digit part per billion uh, levels of mercury, and if you look at the TCLP standard, it's 200 parts per billion. So we're two orders of magnitude below um, the standard, and the mercury is definitely sequestered as that uh, chemical reaction product, that mercuric sulfide on the surface of the particles. Um, we also ran some method 1313 tests, and again, I can tell you more about that, but basically what it showed is is that the uh, other metals do not leach uh, in out of, well, they don't leach out of the fly ash to any great extent, certainly all below T TCLP limits, and that they uh, amended silicates. There's a couple of metals where it actually offers additional protection in terms of even lower um, leachable uh, metals. Uh, but there, in no case did any of the metals go higher than the baseline uh, native fly ash tested uh, neat. Okay, bag fabric. Um, this was a filtration test and it was done by ETSI, an independent lab. They use uh, the ASTM standard 6830 as their protocol. Um, so we provide, no, the, the host utility provided them with some bag samples. We provided them with some amended silicates and um, the host utility provided their standard brominated pack that they use. Every, uh, the amended silicates and brominated pack were blended with the fly ash at a 2% concentration and that was the dust that was used in the uh, testing by ETSI. The data we saw showed no difference between the two in terms of outlet particulate, residual pressure drop, and mass gain on the filter samples. So uh, absolutely no uh, impact from the use of amended silicates as compared to the brominated pack. So for our host site, a uh, couple of conclusions, we were able to show that we can uh, meet the mercury mats rule with amended silicates at injection rates that were appreciably lower than what they were currently uh, needing with their brominated pack system. So there would be a cost, significant cost savings. The method 30B obviously showed that we could um, uh, rely on the data, that it was quality data. Uh, the additional specialized testing in terms of uh, explosibility and fabric uh, performance as well as TCLPs all came back uh, absolutely with, with no impact from the amended silicates. So it all, uh, all looked good. So we're working with this, uh, with this host site to put a contract in place. We'll see uh, as that goes forward. Um, recommendations for a trial in general. Uh, and this is my last slide, so uh, we should maybe give the bar some warning. The, um, you want to be very careful and precise uh, in, in, your, in your planning for a trial. Uh, it's going to allow you to collect the data you need to make informed decisions and to get to a MAT solution that's going to be the best for your particular plant. You want to make sure, certain you pay a lot of attention to detail you want to evaluate the full data set, as I mentioned. Take a look at the big picture, not only the individual test cases. You want to make certain that uh, you understand what the balance of plant impacts are. Put that economic analysis together and don't do it on the back of an envelope. Uh, put a spreadsheet together. It doesn't have to be a terribly sophisticated spreadsheet, but I think it'll help you understand all the elements to go in. Capital costs, operating costs, balance of plant impact. And then put that summary report together because that's the document that's going to be used as backup when the decisions are made. So with that, I'll take questions or uh, we can go have something to drink. Any questions from the floor? Any questions? Don't be shy. One. Ah. On average for your trial, how many days did, you, did it take you to prep before you started testing? 
Um, it depends on what's existing at the plant. For example, if they have a SEMS already on the stack, it, I want to say SEMS installation is a couple of days. Um, uh, the uh, portable super SAC systems are a couple of days. If, you're, if you have to use a portable silo, that's probably a three-day installation. Jim, uh, nice presentation. I, I have a question. You mentioned violence of plant issues. Um, can you give me some guideline as to what you've experienced when you've tried to do a balance of plant with mercury? I know that Connie Sr. has tried to do that and other people have tried to do that across the industry and the closure is not very good. Oh, you're talking about mass balance? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's, it's, it's a qualitative uh, activity rather than quantitative, Bruce. But if you see a decrease in the vapor phase mercury and you don't see corresponding at least an increase, the, the problem in trying to do a mercury balance is trying to figure out what you end up with your mercury measurements in different units. And somehow you've got to get that back to some single unit so you can actually do a mass balance. That can be extremely challenging. How much of your, uh, you'll get parts per million in your fly ash, for example. What does that mean in terms of actual pounds of mercury? And is the, is the stuff in the first hopper of the ESP have a different loading than the stuff in the last hopper? And we've seen that. So I think in terms of a, of a, a rigorous mass balance, it's, it's almost an impossible task. But you should see trends, and you can use those to understand what's going on. Any more questions? Thank you. All right. With that, I will just remind you that we will start again tomorrow morning between 8 and 8.05 or so, and I uh, hope you have a terrific evening. We'll see you tomorrow.